We are continuing our series, Prayer Changes Everything. We are in the home stretch. If you're wondering if this thing is ever going to end, the end is in sight. We will stop just before the AGM. Oh, that was the one thing I wanted to mention. On March 10th, um, because of the AGM and everything that goes into preparing that, um, Brad Weber from KLBC will be here speaking on the 10th. So if you're a supporter of KLBC or know someone who's a supporter of KLBC, he will be here on the 10th sharing about what's happening at camp, sharing a message with us. And uh, so he'll kick off the service and then we'll move into Pollock and AGM to follow. But so I wanted to make sure I didn't forget that. So prayer changes everything this morning. We're looking at faith obedience and prayer and how these things are interconnected when it comes to our um our prayer life we've been talking about how god answers prayer what gets in the way of answering prayer and this is a huge part of it so we're going to look at faith right god said james says if you ask by faith and do not doubt you'll get what you receive uh obedience and how disobedience sometimes gets in the way and uh we're going to talk about praying in jesus name what did Jesus mean when he said, ask for anything in my name and you'll receive it? And uh, I'm going to suggest that maybe, maybe there's some cultural things going on that maybe we're missing and we need to just maybe make a little bit of a shift. So we're going to get there, but uh, we're talking about all of that this morning. So this morning, number one, what does it mean to have faith when we pray? This morning we're going to look at a couple stories involving Jesus' disciples, um, I often stand up here and defend the disciples because we often read their stories and there's a cultural thing going on and we look at what's going on and be like, you dummies, like how are you missing this? What, like open your eyes, you guys. And often there's a cultural thing that we miss and we have to not give them such a bad rap. But the two stories we're going to look at, I think actually we give the disciples too much credit and we need to see something going on culturally that has happened, and it's like, actually, um, you guys need to wake up. You guys need to understand what Jesus is trying to teach us in this. And so this morning, (coughs) we're going to look at a couple of disciple stories, and uh, yeah, hopefully you draw something from their story as we continue to grow in our faith and our walk with Jesus. So, with that said, Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and said, and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, I have, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, you faithless, corrupt people. Ouch. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, <clears throat> rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. After the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Jesus says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be pos- nothing would be impossible. Now, interesting thing in this passage, if you have your physical Bible, you'll notice that that was verse 20, and the next chapter goes, or the next cha- paragraph goes right to verse 22. Um, typo. It doesn't go 2022. We're missing a verse. And that is a translation decision made by um, the English translators. Lots of your English translations will have this. Verse 21 says, This demon can only come out by prayer and fasting. The King James leaves it in, but most don't. And so what is happening in this passage? One thing you need to remember in this, at this point in the story, the disciples are not foreign to, the, to casting out demons. In fact, on two separate occasions, Jesus sent out the disciples on their own. He said, I give you authority to heal the sick and cast out demons and to do all these great and amazing things. They've done this before. So what happened? And why does it, stir, why does it create such an a angry response in Jesus? And what is going on in this verse? Why is he saying, do you, like, 
I wish I had a mustard seed to show you what Jesus is saying. He said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you couldn't see it if I was to hold it. It is so tiny. But we understand, you've been walking along sidewalks and seen flowers shoot through solid cement, right? They come through concrete. Your driveways are at the mercy of these plants. Plants have this amazing ability to move things they shouldn't be able to move. And so Jesus is just pointing out the fact that just like the plant can move the mountain, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move this mountain. And when Jesus says you don't have enough faith, what he's pointing out is that it's not the size, it's not the amount, it's the quality of the faith. One of the interesting things that Mark points out numerous times is that often when Jesus is praying and he tells his disciples to be praying, what are the disciples doing? Sleeping. The Garden of Gethsemane, three times Jesus came to them and said, pray with me so that you don't fall into temptation. And Jesus comes back and they're zonked out. Earlier in Mark, we read the story about the disciples waking up and they're looking for Jesus and they, they can't find him. And the implication of the story is, well, Jesus is doing what he's always done. He's gotten up early and he's spending time with the Father and his disciples as his students and more importantly, as those who are supposed to be imitating him, they're supposed to be doing the same. The disciples are also supposed to be getting up and praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, but instead they have chosen to sleep. And as I read this this week, that, that hit me really hard. Because it's like, I know I need to get up before my family is up. I know I need to get up to pray, but that snooze button is way too convenient. Right? And so what is happening here is the disciples have come into this situation with this young boy and they're full of confidence. They're full, we've done this before, but they're not relying on the God who gives them the authority to cast out this demon. What they've resor- resorted to because they're not praying, because they're not fasting, they're resorting on their own abilities, their own confidence. They're having faith in themselves instead of faith in the heavenly father who gives them the ability and so because of their slow drift because of their the lack of their commitment to be connected to the heavenly father they can't cast out the demon something they've done numerous times before so in light of that context in light of that background it makes sense why jesus is like you corrupt people you still don't get it You're still not putting the pieces together. That is not you. It's the Holy Spirit in you that enables you to do these great and amazing things. So faith isn't actually about the size. It actually has everything to do with the quality. And how are you maintaining your faith? How are you maintaining when James says that if you have faith and do not doubt, you'll receive what you ask for? Because it's not about the amount of the faith about the quality of it. Which brings us to number two. Uh, what role does obedience play in answered prayer? Um, <clears throat> and again, this is a really interesting story involving the disciples. Jesus again is going to bring up this mustard seed faith analogy, um, but he's going to use a different parable as well to kind of execute or make his point. So Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 1, one day Jesus said to his disciples, there will be temptations to sin, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another, per- if another believer sins, rebuke that person, and if there is repentance, forgive. Forgive. Even if the person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive, right? So this is, Matthew says, 70 times seven. doesn't matter how many times they ask, you must be willing to forgive. And the disciples respond this way. The apostle said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. Now this is the NLT using some really soft 
language. What, Jesus, what the disciples actually said in this is increase our faith, a.k.a. if you want us to live this way, if you want us to walk in this level of forgiveness, you have to make my faith greater. Because unless you make, give me more faith, I'm not doing it. That's what there's, they're being cheeky with Jesus. That's not a good idea. You don't get cheeky with him. And so because of their cheeky response of, well, you want us to do this? Give me more faith. This is how Jesus responds. The Lord answered, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. Jesus tells this story, and he is saying this to the disciples. I don't have to do anything. You have to do what you're told. And I think we miss what is going on in this, in this passage because culturally we just don't get it. In lots of countries, if your boss tells you to jump, you don't even ask how high. You just jump. Right? Your, your parents tell you to do something. You don't argue. You don't talk back. You don't get it in their face. Dad tells you to do something, you do it, and you do it as quickly as possible. But in our culture, <laughs> our kids talk back, our employees have rights. We don't talk boss or master and slave. We have bosses and employees, and they like to exercise those rights. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but we don't have this same idea of honor and respect of authority. We try to our society is all about tearing down the hierarchy, not following it. And so we get to this story, and Jesus reminds us that, yes, God is our Father, but He is still God. He is still Lord. He is still King. And when God tells you to do something, He doesn't have to do nothing to help you. You just do it. R.C. Sproul said this about prayer. He wrote a book called, Does, Does Prayer Really Change Anything? And he starts by saying, it doesn't matter if prayer changes anything. You do it because God told you to do it. You don't have, God doesn't have to do anything to make you more forgiving. You just be more forgiving because God said so. Our level of obedience will sometimes get in the way because when we ask God to move, and He says, I need you to participate in the answer. The question isn't, well, you need to open doors. You need to, God, you need to do your part. And God says, no. You do it because I told you to. It's a humility. It's a recognition of who God is and, and, our, will, and our, <laughs> our desire to obey and honor who He is in light of his greatness and his glory we don't talk back to god we don't get cheeky like the disciples we just do as we are told your ability to obey will sometimes get in the way of answered prayer <clears throat> which brings us to this whole idea ooh, of praying in jesus name now i don't know if anyone has noticed and it has kind of made me twitch a little bit all morning. I have intentionally not said in Jesus' name at the end of any of my prayers. I've been very intentional about that. Because what has happened is we have taken, well, here's the verse. Uh, John 14, 13. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. John 14, 13, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. And what has happened is we read this verse and we think this is the formula for successful prayer. God has given us the code word. He's given us the spiritual flair. Oh, somebody prayed in Jesus' name. I need to answer. This isn't a formula. This isn't a methodology. This isn't the secret passcode to get in secret access to God. 
So what is Jesus saying when he says, ask for anything in my name and I will do it? Well, this is what he means. And again, there's some cultural stuff going on that we sometimes can miss. Number one, Jesus wants us to pray in a way that is consistent with his character. Jesus wants us to pray in a way that is consistent with his character. In the ancient world, when Jesus says this, your name was everything. Your name was tied to your reputation. Your, not, your name was tied to your character. Your name was represented everything of who you are. Solomon says this in Proverbs 22, choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. Solomon says, choose to have a good name amongst your neighbors because it is of high value. And not only is he saying you need to pray in a way that is consistent with my character, but number two, Jesus wants us to pray according to his will. Jesus wants us to pray according to his will. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. The literal there is when we ask for anything according to his will. And since we know that he hears us when we ask, when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. When Jesus says, pray in my name, he's saying, you need to pray according to my plan. You need to pray according to what I am trying to accomplish in this world. And the beautiful thing is we don't have to wonder what God's will is. It's not this mysterious thing where we, you know, we roll the dice and hope it works out. We don't like, Ugh. And just guess enough times and maybe it'll come through. Romans 12, 2 says that if our mind is renewed and transformed, we don't conform to the ways of the world, we can know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. James 1 says that if any of you lacks wisdom, to ask God who gives freely and without hesitation. You want to know what God's will is? Ask Him. God, here's the situation. Show me what your will is so I can pray accordingly. Jesus, what do you want? I, as soon as I read that, the first thing that popped in my head was, what would Jesus do? Right? That good old bracelet that we were like, oh, we don't like cliches. It needs to come back. In every situation when we're praying, God, how would you pray in this situation? Jesus, what do you want to accomplish? What would Jesus do? We pray in his name. We pray according to his character. Pray in his name, we pray according to his will. And number three, when we pray in his name, Jesus wants us to pray and act with his authority. It's not just, Jesus, would you move, but Jesus, all of the authority and all of the power that is found in your name and your name alone, I'm going to bring into this situation. Acts chapter 3, Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I will give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. This isn't a prayer. This isn't, G this isn't Peter being like, okay, just a sec before we heal, let's get on our knees and have a little prayer session. No. He is calling on the name of Jesus, saying, in the name of Jesus, you are getting up. Because I know the power, I know the authority, I know the will, I know that God wants to heal you, you're getting healed. This is the same Peter, by the way, who was sleeping every time Jesus checked on him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is, Peter has learned his lesson. And every time, almost every time we encounter Peter in Acts, he is praying and he is meditating, and he is fasting, and God is giving him visions. Peter's learned his lesson so that he can walk in the authority and the power of his Savior's name. So, in light of that, I want to put out a little challenge for you. If you've been in church for a long time, you almost close every single prayer with in Jesus' name by habit. 
And trust me, this morning, as I've been trying to not say it, to be an example, I twitch because it goes against everything I've ever practiced, everything I've ever done. But this week, I want you to try. Don't be legalistic about it. Don't beat yourself up if you forget. But this week, I want you, as you pray, instead of being mindful about closing off with the right sign-off, be more intentional about the content. Jesus, I'm going to pray in your name. So God, is what I am asking consistent with your character? And if it's not, Jesus, show me, show me how I should be praying. Jesus, is what I am asking in con- consistent with your will? And if it's not, show me your will so I can pray accordingly. Jesus, instead of just tacking on in Jesus' name at the end and being like, we're good? I challenge you this week to be more intentional with the content of the prayer, not just the last three words that you say. And if you're anything like me, it's going to be hard, it's going to be challenging, because it's just been an ingrained practice that you always do, right? we got to make sure we close the right way. The Holy Spirit this morning is saying, no, it's not about sending up the spiritual flair. It's about making sure we are praying with the right, we're praying the right prayers in a way that honors our Lord and Savior. With that, let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your name. We thank you for that all-powerful name, that healing and glory and restoration is found in your name alone every knee will bow in your name alone do we find life and forgiveness and healing and restoration in your name that is above every other name and so jesus as we pray this week as we come to you with our requests jesus may your will be planted in our hearts that it's your will not mine Jesus, may your character be planted in our hearts, and not just when we're praying, but God, that we would be imitators of you, Jesus. That in everything we do, and everything we say, people would see your spirit dwelling in us because we do things differently than everyone else. Jesus, help us to pray different, but not just pray different, but to grow in our prayers, to, be, to pray with the power and the authority that is at our disposal. Help us to walk in obedience, Lord. Help us to, help us to have a better faith, not just more, more low quality, but God, that even the little bit of faith we might have would be of the purest quality so that we can glorify and honor you in all that we do. Holy Spirit, dwell in each of our hearts and teach us to pray better. Amen.